Welcome back to Movies Outpost. Today we'll be diving into the action-packed fantasy trilogy titled The Hobbit 1, 2, and 3. Enjoy the recap. Getting ready for a birthday party at the start of The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, our old friend Bilbo Baggins puts pen to paper for a memoir. He starts with the Grand Dwarven Kingdom of Erebor, a place bursting at the seams with riches. It's a friendly neighbor to the human kingdom of Dale and the forest realm of the elves, ruled by the elf king Thrundwheel. Under the mountain, the dwarves, led by their king, Thror, dig into the belly of the earth, unearthing a dazzling hoard of gold and precious stones. Among these treasures, they find the Arkenstone, their most cherished jewel, proudly displayed above Thor's throne. Their wealth and prosperity catch the attention of all, from men to elves, but their greed gets the better of them which causes a disagreement with the elves over diamonds. As the days pass, their gold and greed increases until it reaches a tipping point. One day, all the guards as well as Thorin, Thor's grandson, begin to panic when he announces there is a dragon inbound. The dragon Smaug shoots fire on the stronghold as Thorin hides behind a wall. The dragon then makes its way to the human village where it starts burning everything to the ground. A human grabs a unique arrow and fires it. It does absolutely nothing, and when it's done burning the village, it goes to its main goal. The gold. The dwarves prepare for a fierce battle but as is expected, they get obliterated. Thror grabs the Arkenstone, but as the dragon begins bathing in the gold, he drops it, losing it inside the mountains of gold. The dwarves that survive must leave their home, and to add salt to their wounds, their once friend Thrundwheel refuses to help them from their earlier disagreement, leaving them to fend for themselves. Having set the historical stage, Bilbo decides to narrate his own adventure from 60 years ago. A particular sunny morning in the green pastures of the Shire sees a younger Bilbo peacefully enjoying his pipe outside his hobbit hole. His tranquility is disturbed by a tall figure in a pointed hat and a grey cloak. This is Gandalf the Grey, a wizard on the hunt for a final member to complete his adventure party. Bilbo, quite comfortable with his simple life, has no interest in embarking on an adventure, yet Gandalf is not easily deterred and marks Bilbo's door with a dwarven rune using his staff. The following evening, Bilbo is about to enjoy his supper when he's greeted by an unanticipated guest. The dwarf named Dwalin shows up, acting like he's been expected all along. He devours Bilbo's meal and just as he's finishing, more guests arrive. Balin, Philly, Keeley, eight other dwarves, and finally Gandalf. Bilbo's world of orderliness is turned upside down. The dwarves raid his pantry, move around his furniture, and eat and drink with an enthusiasm that borders on messiness. They even sing a playful song poking fun at the flustered hobbit. To Bilbo's surprise though, they wash up after themselves. Finally, the group's leader Thorin makes his entrance. The dwarves have a mission. They aim to return to Erebor, take back their kingdom, and reclaim their stolen treasure from the dragon. Superstition warns against the bad luck a 13-member group might bring, so they need a 14th member, a burglar. Gandalf vouches for Bilbo, insisting he's a top-notch burglar and also says that Bilbo, being a hobbit, would have a scent unfamiliar to the dragon. To sweeten the deal, Gandalf presents Thorin with a key that could open a secret entrance into Erebor. They offer Bilbo a slice of the profits precisely 1 14th. But Bilbo hesitates, torn between the call of adventure and the comfort of his quiet life. He eventually tells Gandalf he can't abandon his peaceful life and rejects the contract. The following morning Bilbo wakes up to an empty house. His first reaction is relief, the dwarves have left. But as he stands alone in the quiet, he feels a pang of disappointment. He finds the contract signed by Thorin, and in a whirl of excitement, he makes a snap decision to chase after the adventure he's just turned down. Rushing out to catch up with the dwarves on the road, he's given a pony to ride. The adventure has started for Bilbo, but he clings to his comforts. He gripes about the pony rub causing him a sore, stops everyone for a handkerchief, and in spite of everything, his journey into the unknown begins. Thorin and his crew journey eastwards for several days. One evening, the stillness of the wild is pierced by screams that send a chill down Bilbo's spine. The dwarves find his fear amusing until Thorin stands, silencing their laughter with a stern look. Balin then starts to unfold the story of Thorin's deep-rooted animosity towards the orcs. He tells of how they, having lost their home, set their sights on Moria, another dwarven kingdom, which was overrun by these vile orcs. Despite their courage and determination, the orcs led by the massive pale orc, Azog, push them back. In the fierce battle, Azog slays Thror, sending Thorin into a rage. He fights Azog, using an oak branch as a shield when he loses his own, earning him the name Oakenshield. In this duel, he injures Azog, cutting off his arm and forcing the orc soldiers to retreat. But victory comes at a cost, hundreds of their men dead, Thorin's father missing, and the death of their leader Thror. Thorin is left to manage the remains of his grandfather's empire. As Balin narrates this tale, an orc spots the dwarves and rushes to relay this information to his master. The following day, the dwarves continue their journey, but the weather turns against them, unleashing a downpour. The dwarves grumble and ask Gandalf to change the weather, but he explains that it's beyond his power. 
The scene then shifts to another wizard named Radagast, the protector of a verdant forest. He notices that leaves are beginning to wilt, and his animal friends are dead. He rushes one of his sickly friends back to his home, trying every medicine he can think of to save the creature. Suddenly, massive shadows loom on his windows, and he realizes that dark magic is causing this distress. With a brave heart, he starts a spell that extracts the dark magic from the creature, saving its life. Stepping outside, Radagast sees a terrifying sight, enormous spiders marching in a line. Driven by curiosity and concern, he follows them, leading him to a deserted castle. After a hard day of travel, Thorin instructs his companions to rest for the night. In the stillness of the evening, Bilbo ventures to bring Philly and Keeley some food, but instead he stumbles upon a puzzling disappearance of some of their horses. They scout the surrounding area and spot a distant fire. Approaching cautiously, they find three towering trolls. As the group's designated burglar, Bilbo is nudged forward to rescue the four ponies captured by the trolls. He attempts a stealthy rescue but unfortunately the trolls discover him. He tries to escape them but is eventually seized. Bilbo starts contemplating the best spices to season him with before they feast. Suddenly the rest of the dwarves burst onto the scene assaulting the trolls. Their swords slice through the air and it looks like they might triumph. However, the tides turn when the trolls snatch Bilbo, forcing the dwarves to surrender their weapons under the threat of Bilbo's life. Soon half the dwarf company are strung up on a large rotating spit over the troll's fire, while the others are crammed into large sacks. As the situation grows dire, Bilbo plays for time, suggesting the dwarves are infected. Just when hope seems lost, Gandalf appears out of nowhere. With a swift move of his staff, he splits a boulder, and sunlight streams through the crack turning the trolls into solid stone. Upon realizing that the trolls would need a cave to take shelter from the daytime sun, the group embarks on a search, eventually discovering the hidden lair. Inside, Gandalf and the dwarves come upon a trove of goods not ordinary ones, but magical elven swords and other treasures. Gandalf presents the smallest sword to Bilbo, telling him that it'll glow blue when orcs and goblins are nearby. The other swords are the legendary Glamdring, which Gandalf claims for himself, and its twin Orcrist that Gandalf proposes should be Thorin's. Initially, Thorin is hesitant about using an elven sword, but Gandalf persuades him, emphasizing that such a splendid weapon is a rare find indeed. Later on one of the dwarves brings distressing news, all the ponies have fled. At this moment, Radagast the Brown, arrives in a sleigh pulled by rabbits. He conveys to Gandalf the disturbing presence of evil in the forest and the deserted fortress of Dal Guldur. He shares his encounter with the terrifying spirit, the Witch King of Angmar, and hands over an object wrapped in cloth to Gandalf. Shortly after, the orc pets appear, but they are swiftly dealt with. Sensing the imminent threat from the orcs, Radagast departs in his rabbit-drawn sleigh, intending to lead them astray. In the meantime, the group proceeds across a hilly open landscape, while the orcs, riding their menacing wargs, are on Radagast's trail. However, one orc veers off and locates the group, which alerts the rest. As they are pursued, Gandalf steers them into a deep crevice for cover. Keeley manages to take down a few more orcs as they all find refuge among the rocks. Suddenly, the orcs are vanquished, and the rest chased off by a group of elvish horsemen, appearing as if out of nowhere. As the men navigate through the crevice, they emerge near Rivendell, Elrond's dwelling. Thorin, who holds a grudge against elves, expresses his displeasure, accusing Gandalf of steering them towards Elrond's domain intentionally. Elrond, along with his riders, appears and extends a warm welcome to Gandalf and the dwarves. Gandalf manages to persuade Thorin to present the map to Elrond. Examining the map, Elrond notices mysterious writing that can only be interpreted under the moonlight, on the same calendar day and during the same phase of the moon as when it was inscribed, which fortuitously happens to be that very night. The map reveals blue letters under the moon's glow. Elrond deciphers these instructions, leading to the entrance of the Lonely Mountain. The dwarves must be at a specific location on the mountainside on a precise day in late summer, and the setting sun will reveal the door. The scene then cuts to the orc army and the commander that failed to capture the dwarves. He pleads his master for mercy, but to no one's surprise, he is fed to their pets. Azog then states there is a price on Thorin's head. We jump back to find Gandalf convening a meeting with Saruman, Galadriel, and Elrond. The topic of discussion is a spotted necromancer and some foreboding signs of evil. Saruman expresses dismissive indifference, stating that the wicked spirit was defeated centuries ago and couldn't possibly amass enough power to return, let alone manifest once more. Gandalf then unveils the object Radagast had given him, wrapped in cloth. A Morgul blade, a weapon of tremendous evil power believed to have been sealed deep within a mountain. Galadriel pledges her quiet promise of support to Gandalf when he needs it. While Gandalf is still behind, Bilbo and the dwarves push forward on their quest, traversing diverse terrains and scaling mountains. Their journey becomes treacherous when they are caught in a thunderstorm while attempting to climb a mountain. The legends turn out to be true as they find themselves in the midst of a stone giant brawl. 
The dwarves are standing on one of the giants, which has come alive to engage in battle. Half of the company makes it to safety, while the other half is caught up in the crossfire, dodging punches and enormous rocks hurled by the brawling giants. Eventually, they manage to escape, although Bilbo is left hanging precariously. Thorin leaps to Bilbo's rescue pulling him up before scolding him for leaving his comfortable hobbit life. That night, disheartened, Bilbo tries to slip away, but Bofur sees him and tries to persuade him to remain with the group. Bilbo can't shake off the feeling that he isn't cut out for the adventure-filled life of the dwarves. Suddenly, Bilbo's sword emits a blue glow, the ground gives way beneath them, and they all plummet down a chasm onto a wooden prison platform. They find themselves surrounded and captured by a horde of goblins. In the ensuing chaos, Bilbo manages to slip away but soon finds himself in combat with a lone goblin. Their fight makes them both stumble and takes them deeper into the abyss. As the dwarves are dragged before the great goblin, Bilbo finds himself in a creepy situation. He awakes to witness Gollum brutally killing the goblin that had fallen with him, and during the scuffle, Gollum unknowingly drops a small golden ring. Intrigued, Bilbo quickly picks up the ring and pockets it, an act that will change his fate in ways unimaginable. Gollum soon notices Bilbo's presence, and the hobbit draws his sword in self-defense. They engage in a tense, surreal encounter that leads to a contest of riddles. The deal is simple. If Bilbo wins, Gollum will show him the exit. If he loses, he becomes Gollum's next meal. Meanwhile the dwarves are brought before the great goblin, he recoils at the sight of their elven-forged swords, especially Orcrist, known amongst goblins as the feared Goblin Cleaver. The great goblin orders the execution of the dwarves and sends a messenger to inform Azog of the location of Thorin and his company. Just as the goblins are about to commence their torture, there is a sudden blast of bright light that leaves everyone momentarily blinded. Gandalf, the Grey Wizard has arrived just in time. He quickly urges the dwarves to seize the opportunity and run for their lives. They fight their way through the pursuing goblins, precariously dashing across rickety wooden bridges and down towering staircases within the Goblin Kingdom. Just as they're about to reach safety, the Great Goblin emerges, blocking their escape. Gandalf, quick to act, slays the Great Goblin with his sword, Glamdring. The ensuing chaos causes the wooden platform they are standing on to collapse, and they all tumble into the depths of the Goblin Cavern. Elsewhere Bilbo, still in the grips of his riddle contest with Gollum, asks a final question. What have I got in my pocket? Gollum not considering this a proper riddle, and infuriated by the situation, refuses to honor the agreement. He begins chasing Bilbo figuring out that he stole his ring. In the confusion, Bilbo accidentally slips on the ring, making him invisible to Gollum's desperate searching eyes. In the midst of their chaotic escape, Gandalf and the dwarves unwittingly run past the invisible Bilbo and Gollum, escaping the goblin caves into the open daylight. Bilbo has a chance to kill Gollum but refrains. He leaps over the enraged creature and slips out of the cave entrance, following his companions into freedom. The group finds a momentary break in a nearby wooded area, catching their breaths from their daring escape. However Gandalf, while counting heads, notices Bilbo's absence. Thorin suggests that Bilbo has run off, longing for the comfort of his hobbit hole. However Bilbo, who is still invisible and nearby, listens to Thorin's harsh words. Suddenly revealing his presence, Bilbo stands up to Thorin, admitting his longing for home, but also declaring his commitment to the dwarves. He says that he will stick with them because they don't have a home of their own, whereas he does. Out of nowhere, Ozog and his team of warg riders show up. He orders his minions to chase after our group. The group doesn't just stand there, they run for cover and manage to bring down a few warg riders. Even Bilbo bags a kill, but their pursuers chase them to the edge of a cliff. To escape, the group decide to climb up trees. Meanwhile, Gandalf catches a moth, whispers something to it, and lets it fly away. Azog shows up on his mighty white warg, and Thorin is shocked to see he's still alive. Then Azog commands his beast to attack the group. The creatures start climbing the trees, their weight threatening to bring them down. They have to keep climbing higher from one falling tree to the next, until they're on the last tree hanging off the mountainside. Gandalf takes a pinecone, sets it on fire and throws it at the wargs. The others follow his lead, and soon the whole area is ablaze, forcing the animals to retreat. But the tree is teetering dangerously, about to fall and take them all down with it. Thorin in a moment of bravery, decides to rush Azog. He walks through the flames and charges. He's easily knocked down and looks like he's about to become dinner for Azog's warg. Just when a minion is about to finish Thorin off, Bilbo steps in, saving Thorin from a certain death. Inspired, the other dwarves join in the fight. The battle rages on between the two sides. Bilbo, however, has caught Azog's attention. Meanwhile, at the tree, Gandalf drops two dwarves who are safely caught by giant eagles. The eagles join in the fight, grabbing enemies and dropping them off the cliff one after another. One eagle swoops in and picks up Thorin, while another grabs Bilbo. The rest of the dwarves are also picked up by the eagles. Just as the last tree falls over the cliff, Gandalf is saved by an eagle. 
allowing them a successful escape. The eagles whisk the group off to the Carrick, a small mountain sitting in the middle of a river. It's a safe place where they can catch their breath for a bit. When Thorin comes to, he's grateful to Bilbo. He says he was wrong for doubting him and that he proved his bravery in battle. Off in the distance, Bilbo spots the lonely mountain. They all stop and stare, awestruck, realizing their home is getting closer. Over at the gates of the old dwarf fortress, a little bird, a thrush, picks up a snail in its beak and taps it against the stone. Inside, Smaug the dragon stirs from his bed of gold coins and opens one eye. Weeks later, on a stormy night, Thorin Oakenshield sneaks into the prancing pony in Bree. Inside, he encounters Gandalf, who curiously asks about his presence in Bree. Thorin shares rumors he's heard about his father, Thrain, wandering around these parts. Gandalf, however, is under the impression that Thrain died in battle, yet Thorin revisits that horrifying day. His father had boldly gone to confront Azog, and mysteriously vanished. After the dust of the battle had settled, Thrain's body was never found. Interrupting Thorin's recollection, Gandalf urges him to focus on reclaiming his homeland and rallying the fragmented dwarf kingdoms. He tells him that there's a bounty on his head, and suggests that he obtains the Arkenstone gem. This would force the dwarf kingdoms to rally behind Thorin as per their pledge of allegiance. This precious gem is concealed within the lonely mountain, under the watchful eye of the dragon. To retrieve the gem without disturbing Smaug, a task as delicate as it is dangerous, they would need the skills of a proficient and stealthy burglar. Fast forward to a year later, and Thorin and his group are being chased down the Carrick by Azog and his orcs. Bilbo is on a ridge keeping a lookout, and he spots a huge bear stalking them. He rushes back to warn the group. Gandalf seems to know the bear, and tells them about a nearby house where they can hide. As they run off and the orcs chase them, they stop upon hearing the bear's roar. The group has to run for the house. When they get there, the bear attacks them, but they manage to keep it out by barring the door. Gandalf says the house belongs to Bayorn, a skin changer who turns into the bear. As a bear, Bayorn is wild and unpredictable, but as a man, he's more likely to listen to reason and he might be able to help them on their journey. On that very night, Azog and his band of warriors keep a watchful eye on Bayorn's house from afar, yet they are hesitant to launch an attack. Bayorn in his mighty bear form poses a formidable threat. Suddenly, Bolg, Azog's son, arrives with a message. He has been summoned to Dal Galder by the ominous necromancer. Once at Dal Galder, Azog is tasked with a new mission by the necromancer. He is to lead his armies, putting aside his pursuit of the dwarven company. Although reluctant, Azog obeys and assigns Bolg to continue the hunt for the dwarves. As the scene shifts, Bayorn transforms back into his human form, welcoming the new day. As the sun shines, we see human Bayorn chopping wood, deep in discussion with the dwarven company about their risky quest. He doubts they will survive the journey to the forest of Mirkwood, noting the rise of orc activity in the land. Despite his dislike for dwarves, he admits his hatred for orcs is much greater. The orcs, led by Azog, have nearly eradicated his kind for their vile amusement. In a surprising turn of events, Bayorn decides to lend his horses to the company to aid them in reaching Mirkwood safely. During a conversation with Gandalf, Bayorn shares rumors of an unholy pact between the orcs and the necromancer, and of the dead walking amongst the living. Gandalf is reminded of the tombs where they had once buried a formidable evil. With this grim thought, Bayorn transforms back into a bear, ready to delay the orcs, now led by Bolg, in their pursuit of the dwarves. Upon reaching the edge of the forest, Gandalf stumbles upon ominous graffiti in the black speech inscribed on an aged statue. At the same time, he receives a telepathic plea from Galadriel, urging him to probe into the mysteries of the High Fells of Rudor. Without explaining the reason for his abrupt departure, Gandalf advises the company to stick to the elf path through Mirkwood, and to hold off entering the Lonely Mountain until he joins them. Undeterred, the dwarves venture into the maze-like forest. As days pass without a glimpse of sunlight or the forest's end, a sense of unease and paranoia begin to unsettle the group. Their journey leads them to a chasm where the path abruptly ends, pushing them further into panic when they realize they are lost. In an attempt to find a way, Bilbo climbs a tree to get a clearer view. On reaching the top, Bilbo is delighted to see they are closer to the forest's edge than they thought, with the long lake visible in the distance. He hurriedly calls down to his companions to share his findings, but to his surprise, there is no response. As he clambers down, he stumbles on a web and falls straight into an even larger web. To his horror, a giant spider rushes down and quickly ensnares him in its web. As the spider's venom loses its potency, Bilbo's blurred vision clears to see the dwarves, bound tightly by the giant spiders. A spider hoists Bilbo into the air, but he quickly retaliates, using his small sword to slash through the webbing and stab the creature. The spider crumples to the ground, providing Bilbo with the chance to cut himself loose and take cover behind a tree. Slipping the ring onto his finger, Bilbo can now understand the spider's speech. They chatter excitedly about feasting on the dwarves. Spotting an opportunity, 
Bilbo hurls a stick into the distance. The curious spiders scuttle towards the noise, leaving one spider behind. Bilbo quickly dispatches this lone creature, revealing himself briefly as he removes the ring to land the final blow. Bilbo starts to free the dwarves, but another spider pounces on him. In the scuffle, he stabs the creature but loses the ring. The spiders swarm back towards the dwarves, who manage to kill three of them back to back. Bilbo finds his ring, only to see a spider bearing down on the precious object. He engages the creature, ultimately reclaiming his prize. He protectively cradles the ring, echoing Gollum's possessive obsession with his precious. Meanwhile, the dwarves fend off the remaining spiders, but just as they are about to be overrun by the monstrous nightmares, a figure springs into action, an elven warrior known as Legolas. The dwarves find themselves surrounded by the elves, and simultaneously Keeley is at the brink of becoming spider food when another elf, Tauriel, joins the fray. Her arrows fly, eliminating five spiders in quick succession. After the spiders have been dealt with, Legolas orders his troops to disarm the dwarves and seize their weapons. His attention is drawn to an elvish blade among Thorin's possessions. Doubting that the dwarf acquired it in good faith, Legolas commands his men to take the dwarves prisoner. Meanwhile, Bilbo remains unnoticed. With the invisibility of the ring, he tails the elven party. The elves escort their captives to the halls of the elven king, oblivious to the small hobbit shadowing their steps. While his companions are confined to cells, Thorin is led before the father of Legolas, King Thrundwheel. The elven king, aware of Thorin's quest to reclaim the Lonely Mountain, proposes an alliance. He will aid Thorin in his endeavor in exchange for a portion of the mountain's treasure. Thorin hesitates briefly, but then rejects the offer with pure rage, reminding Thrundwheel of the elves' failure to help the dwarves during the siege of the Lonely Mountain. Thrundwheel, infuriated by this response, orders Thorin to join his comrades in the dungeon until he becomes more agreeable to his proposition. In the meantime, the elf maiden Tauriel approaches the cell of Keeley. He's examining a talisman, and their conversation blossoms from this small detail. Despite their disparate backgrounds, they find a mutual curiosity towards each other. In contrast, Balin's anger flares at Thorin's rash dismissal of the elven king's offer, their only chance at negotiation. Thorin reveals, however, that he's been aware of Bilbo's stealthy presence, and indeed, the hobbit makes an unexpected appearance. To everyone's surprise, Bilbo brandishes a key he pilfered from the wine cellars. With the newfound key in hand, Bilbo swiftly liberates each of the dwarves from their respective cells one by one, leading them all in a clandestine retreat. Simultaneously, the elven guards discover the absence of their prisoners, inciting an uproar. Undeterred by the chaos ensuing around them, Bilbo directs the dwarves towards the wine barrels and instructs them to jump in. They hesitate initially, skeptical of the seemingly ludicrous escape plan, but with Thorin's assurance, they take the leap of faith. One after another, the dwarves dive into the barrels and Bilbo, playing the part of the unflappable orchestrator, rolls them into the river below. Their successful escape elicits a word of gratitude from Thorin, the dwarves bobbing in the frothy current of the open river, almost tasting freedom. Their relief, however, is short-lived as elves on the riverbank spot them, and promptly move to secure the gate blocking their passage. Just when it seems they might be apprehended, Bolg and his band of orcs ambush the elves, creating a distracting melee. Amidst the pandemonium, Keeley is struck by a poisoned Morgul arrow as he labors to lift the portcullis blocking their path. Then enter Legolas and Tauriel, elven warriors unparalleled in their archery skills, turning the battlefield into their personal hunting ground. Arrow after arrow finds its mark, dropping orcs with precision and elegance that is simply breathtaking to watch. Somehow Keeley, battling his crippling pain, manages to trigger the gate mechanism and plunges into a barrel. The company careens down the swift current, evading the orcs that continue their onslaught from the banks. Each adversary that dares approach them, however, meets a swift end, either at the hands of the dwarves or the impeccable archery of Legolas and Tauriel. In a spectacular display of combat prowess, Legolas and Tauriel cut down their enemies with extraordinary flair. Their attacks are executed with such finesse that they seem to be part of a grand planned dance of death. Yet, despite their valiant efforts, they cannot stop the escape of Bilbo and the dwarves. The company, braving the raging river, continue their journey towards the Lonely Mountain, leaving the battlefield behind. Within the stony confines of the elven stronghold, an orc captive is brought before the stern gaze of King Thrundwheel. The captive speaks in fearful whispers, revealing that the One, a title echoing with dread implications, has returned. Thrundwheel kills the captive and orders his men to seal off the kingdom. Yet Tauriel, driven by concern for Keeley's well-being and her knowledge of his poisoning, defies these orders and ventures out. Legolas, ever the loyal friend, follows suit upon discovering Tauriel's departure. Meanwhile, the dwarven company emerges from the woodland labyrinth onto the shores of the expansive Long Lake. 
they find themselves unexpectedly at the mercy of Bard, a skilled archer with a watchful eye and a steady hand. The tension ripples through the air until it is eased by Balin's astute insight. Recognizing Bard as a bargeman from Lake Town, also known as Eskaroth, he uses this information to defuse the situation. Venturing into the treacherous high fells, Gandalf steps foot into an ominous crypt-like structure. He slips sliding down but manages to secure himself onto a narrow staircase. Gandalf ventures further into its shadowy depths, navigating the unforgiving dark. Suddenly Radagast startles Gandalf with his abrupt appearance, questioning the choice of this meeting spot. He comes across another chamber, its iron gate torn open, housing an empty tomb. He reveals the chamber's history as a prison for the Nazgul, a name that sends chills down the spine. Gandalf believes they have been summoned to Dal Guldur by the necromancer, Radagast contests, believing no human sorcerer could wield such powerful dark magic. However Gandalf posits his suspicion that the necromancer might not be a human after all, but a weakened, disguised form of a far more powerful entity. Cloaked in the dull twilight and shrouded mist of Lake Town, the dwarves are smuggled in by Bard. Hidden within the confines of worn fish barrels, they are under the watchful eyes of Alfred, the master's overbearing second-in-command. His suspicions are roused by Bard's unexpected haul from Mirkwood, a territory not licensed to him for fishing. Bard, with the skill of a seasoned smuggler and a sharp mind, manages to talk Alfred down from tipping the barrels and exposing his concealed guests. Evading further scrutiny, Bard guides the dwarves to the relative safety of his humble abode. This small but vital victory allows the dwarves to catch their breath in the heart of Lake Town, hidden from the prying eyes of the master and his henchmen. The company, in their haste, try to steal some weapons but alas they get caught. Soon, our dwarven friends are presented before the town's leader, the master and his people. They're introduced to the real Bard, a man of serious lineage. Bard is a descendant of Dale's last ruler, Girion, who met his end valiantly, trying to kill the fearsome dragon Smaug using black arrows during Dale's fall. Here, Thorin steps up, laying bare his identity and his company's noble quest. He makes a convincing case to the townsfolk and the master, help him reclaim the mountain and we'll share its riches with you. The master quickly agrees. The adventurers, amidst cheers and good wishes, set off on their journey. However, not all is well. Thorin orders Keeley, who's been wounded, to stay behind. His brother Philly chooses to stay with him. In a show of solidarity, Oin, Bofer, and Philly decide to stay back too, ensuring Keeley is well taken care of in Bard's humble dwelling. Elsewhere, with Radagast's words ringing in their ears, both he and Gandalf return to Dal Galdr's entrance. Gandalf, feeling the weight of responsibility, instructs Radagast to alert Galadriel about what they've found. Boldly, he goes in alone, his sword in hand. He knows that it is most certainly a trap, and that something very wrong is taking place. He mutters powerful words under his breath, casting spells to attempt to break the illusionary charm that hides the fortress's true nature. His spells echo through the halls and reaches Azog who says that the wizard will lift the spell and find them. Gandalf traverses around Dal Guldur. As he walks around he is attacked by a feral creature. After chasing him around for some time he manages to subdue the creature and cast a spell on him. The creature, much to Gandalf's surprise and sadness, turns out to be the dwarf Thrain, an old friend as well as Thorin's father. Determined to get Thrain out of this accursed place, Gandalf guides him, and during this journey Thrain shares the grim tale of his capture. He tells of his confrontation with Azog on the battlefield, where he was struck down. Instead of killing him, Azog chose to steal the ring from Thrain's hand and keep him as a captive. Realizing the grave implications of losing one of the seven dwarven rings, Gandalf insists they must hurry back to find his son on the Lonely Mountain. Thrain then tells Gandalf he is a fool for giving his son the key and map, as Smaug is in leagues with their enemy, and no one should be next to that mountain. Suddenly, Azog appears and knocks the duo down. Azog, being held at bay, reveals the fortress for what it really is, a secret base for an enormous army of orcs. Gandalf asks of his master's whereabouts, to which Azog chillingly responds, he is everywhere. Gandalf conjures a blinding light spell to confuse the orcs and escapes with Thrain. He even brings down a massive fortress wall to keep the orcs from tailing him. Just as he reaches the entrance, he comes face to face with the necromancer, a gigantic entity made of pure dark energy. Its shadowy tentacles grabs Thrain and disappears, it reappears, and a battle of light against dark ensues, with the necromancer unleashing a torrent of shadow energy at Gandalf, who fights back with a protective shield. Despite a tense standoff, Gandalf is overpowered by the necromancer, who appears engulfed in fire, he destroys Gandalf's staff and pins him telepathically to a wall. Gandalf's worst fears come true as the necromancer reveals his true identity. He is Sauron. Gandalf is then forced into a cage, where he must watch the orc armies unite with one goal and location in mind. To head to the lonely mountain where his friends are awaiting his arrival. Meanwhile Thorin and his company are navigating their way through some challenging landscapes and finally find themselves at the once thriving city of Dale. It's a haunting sight. 
Balin shares the sad tale of Dale, a city left in ruins for two centuries since Smaug's devastating arrival. Their journey continues until they reach the majestic gates of the Lonely Mountain. It's here that Bilbo, the unassuming hobbit, finds a secret stairway cleverly hidden in one of the towering dwarf statues guarding the entrance. When they reach the supposed location of a secret door, they all search frantically for the elusive keyhole, but as the sun dips below the horizon, their efforts prove fruitless. Dejected, the dwarves start to head back, but Bilbo isn't ready to admit defeat. Just as the last light fades, Bilbo spots a thrush knocking at the wall. Then, as the moon takes the sun's place, its silvery glow reveals the secret door. The words of the map suddenly make sense, it was the last moon of autumn that would illuminate the door. Calling his companions back, they manage to unlock the door, finally gaining access into the mountain. With the secret door now open, Balin finally discloses the real reason they've brought Bilbo on this perilous journey. Their task for him, to tiptoe into the treasure chamber of the Lonely Mountain and snatch the coveted Arkenstone without waking the slumbering Smaug. Summoning all his bravery, Bilbo accepts the mission and ventures into the desolate Dwarven Kingdom, his eyes landing on a staggering sight, an ocean of gold and gems, Smaug's hoard. Bilbo starts the daunting search for the Arkenstone, but his efforts accidentally cause a cascade of treasure, revealing the sleeping dragon underneath. As Smaug stirs, Bilbo is struck with a sense of dread, realizing the dragon is much larger than he ever imagined. The dragon awakes and begins to move, causing Bilbo to fall and attracting Smaug's attention. Swiftly, Bilbo slips on the ring to conceal himself as Smaug, sensing an intruder, rises from his golden bed. His towering form sweeps the chamber as he calls out for the hidden guest, his senses alert to Bilbo's presence. When Smaug comes too close for comfort, fear gets the better of Bilbo, and he tries to escape which catches Smaug's attention. The dragon gives chase, forcing Bilbo to seek refuge behind a gigantic pillar, the ring still keeping him hidden. As Smaug continues his search, he notes something unusual about Bilbo, an item made of gold but far more precious. Fearfully, Bilbo removes the ring, revealing himself to the dragon. Smaug, tickled by Bilbo's knowledge of his fearsome reputation, engages the hobbit in conversation, eager to deduce his origins. When Bilbo fabricates a tale of traveling alone just to behold the dragon, Smaug counters with his awareness of the dwarves in their quest to retake the mountain. He reveals he's also privy to the mounting threat of Sauron, voicing the futility of their quest as Sauron readies to reveal himself once again. The crafty dragon then discerns Bilbo's real mission to steal the Arkenstone. Smaug intriguingly suggests he might even let Bilbo take it, eager to witness the gem ensnare Thorin just as it did Thror. However, the dragon's amusement soon evaporates, replaced by a hunger to feast on the Hobbit. Bilbo barely manages to evade Smaug's jaws using the ring's invisibility, sending the dragon into a fit of fury. The treasure chamber lights up as Smaug breathes fire, hoping to roast the elusive Bilbo before he can make his escape. Over at Lake Town, Bard is alerted by the ground-shaking rumbles of Smaug's awakening. He hurries to prepare the last black arrow on the town's windlands, but as he does so, he entrusts the arrow to his son and soon after he's apprehended. Simultaneously on the village rooftops, Bolg and his orc squadron have spotted Bofur and discreetly trail him until they encounter the remaining three dwarves Oin, Philly, and Bofur, along with Bard's children. The group falls under attack by the orc party, who have been on their heels since their narrow evasion in Mirkwood. The orcs infiltrate Bard's home, yet are unexpectedly met by the elven duo, Legolas and Tauriel, who make a timely entrance. Tauriel with her blades dancing swiftly cuts down a wave of orcs then steps back to let Legolas take center stage. When the orcs inform Bolg that Oakenshield isn't among the dwarves, he orders his forces to pull back to the bridge. Although the orcs have been temporarily repelled, attention quickly turns to Keeley's worsening condition. Tauriel attempts to heal his Morgul-inflicted wound while Legolas gives chase to the retreating orcs. Thanks to Tauriel's skilled hands, Keeley is freed from the Morgul poison. In his delirious state, he confesses his deep affection for her as well. Legolas finally catches up to Bolg. They both engage in a vicious duel which goes back and forth until Borg realizes he's not an easy kill, and sacrifices two minions so that he may make an escape on his ward to warn Azog that the dwarves have entered the Lonely Mountain. Driven by a newfound resolve, Thorin enters the belly of the Lonely Mountain alone, only to be consumed by the sight of the sprawling treasure hoard. The intoxicating greed of wealth washes over him as Bilbo appears, frantically urging Thorin that they need to leave. But Thorin stops him with a threatening wave of his sword, demanding to know if Bilbo has found the Arkenstone. Bilbo, taken aback, evades the question, but their tense standoff is cut short by the ominous arrival of Smaug at the other end of the treasure chamber. Suddenly, the remaining dwarves burst into the chamber weapons drawn, further enraging the dragon. In his fury, Smaug gives chase and attempts to incinerate them with his scorching breath. 
the dwarves manage to narrowly avoid his wrath, and Smaug, adopting a more cunning approach, begins silently prowling the forsaken halls in search of his intruders. Meanwhile, the dwarves attempt to escape through a service passage out of the Lonely Mountain. They find it blocked and chillingly littered with mummified corpses, a grim testament to the fate of their kin. They realize that Smaug is effectively barricading their only means of escape from the mountain. Refusing to share the same doomed fate, the dwarves conjure a daring plan. They decide to lure Smaug into the cavernous forges of the Lonely Mountain, in the desperate hope that they can trick the dragon into igniting the dormant smelting vats with his fiery breath. Their return to the main hall is abruptly interrupted by the imposing figure of Smaug, setting off a treacherous game of cat and mouse throughout the labyrinthine corridors of the mountain. Despite their perilous position, the dwarves use every trick at their disposal to hinder the pursuing dragon as they sprint toward the entrance to the Lonely Mountain. They finally reach the forges, where Thorin baits Smaug into unleashing his blistering breath upon them, successfully duping him into reigniting the massive forges. Amidst the chaos, they evade the vengeful dragon, becoming separated as Thorin directs them to make a break for the Gallery of Kings. Smaug, seeing Bilbo, gives chase and quickly corners the Hobbit in the Gallery of Kings. Crashing through the gallery's wall, Smaug roars with understanding. He has realized that Bilbo and the dwarves were aided by the people of Lake Town, whom he now vows to destroy. Bilbo cries out in protest, claiming the people of Lake Town are innocent. Smaug halts, expressing wicked delight at Bilbo's compassion, and promises Bilbo a front row seat to their destruction. Just as Smaug prepares to leave, Thorin emerges atop a gigantic stone mold at the end of the hall, taunting the dragon. As Smaug advances, Thorin defiantly declares their intention for revenge. He signals to the other dwarves who, it is revealed, are manning enormous chains attached to the stone mold. As the dwarves heave on the chains, the mold crumbles apart, revealing a vast newly cast golden statue of the dwarf king. Smaug is momentarily awestruck by the statue which then spectacularly bursts, unleashing a tidal wave of molten gold that engulfs the dragon. However, to the dwarves' dismay, Smaug emerges from the molten gold undeterred. With a chilling roar he promises to show the true meaning of revenge, he crashes through the mountain walls and takes to the sky, he streaks towards Lake Town where he says, I am fire, I am death. Bilbo and the others are left horrified at what they have unleashed upon the world. The Hobbit The Battle of the Five Armies kicks off exactly where the second left off, in the midst of a rising panic, as the dragon Smaug descends upon Lake Town, intent on exacting his revenge. The townsfolk, led by their master and his deputy Alfred, are in a state of pandemonium, attempting to evacuate with their treasures. Smaug makes his grand entrance, his flames obliterating rows of homes and ending the lives of hundreds of townsfolk. In the midst of the chaos, Bard, the town's resident bowman, struggles to free himself from his cell, while his children are hurried away by Tauriel, Keeley, Philly, Bofer, and Oin. Undeterred by the scrambling townsfolk, Smaug launches a second and a third strike, turning Lake Town into a burning inferno. On breaking free from his cell, Bard witnesses the horrific scene unfolding. Smaug continues his onslaught, making pass after pass over the town raining destruction upon its unfortunate residents. Atop the lonely mountain, a distraught group of dwarves, including Bilbo, watch the horror unfolding in Lake Town. Thorin is too overcome to join them in their guilt. Bard, Lake Town's last beacon of hope, ascends building after building, skillfully evading Smaug's fiery onslaught. He finally reaches the summit of the bell tower, from where he gazes upon the burning ruins of his home. Undeterred, he takes aim and loses arrow after arrow at the dragon, managing to score several direct hits. However, Smaug's tough-scaled hide is impervious to his arrows. Meanwhile, on a boat navigating the fiery waters, Bard's son Bane spots his father atop the bell tower. Realizing his father needs the black arrow to slay the dragon, Bane springs into action. Smaug, reveling in the chaos, smashes into the bell tower, cracking Bard's bow. Unfazed, he lands, taking a moment to laugh and taunt Bard and his son. He warns him that he can't save his son from the impending inferno. With no other options, Bard fashions a makeshift crossbow and using Bane's shoulder as support takes aim at Smaug with the black arrow. Just as Smaug charges towards them, Bard implores his son to stay calm. At the very last moment, with Smaug mere seconds from them, Bard releases the arrow. It strikes true, hitting the weak spot in Smaug's armor. The dragon roars in agony as the tower collapses into the lake below. Smaug ascends into the air, roaring in pain as the life slowly drains from his body, before becoming motionless and plummeting into the lake, his lifeless body crushing both the master of Lake Town and his stash of gold. On the lonely mountain, the dwarves and Bilbo cheer as they witness the demise of Smaug from afar. However, Thorin appears lost in his own thoughts, seemingly oblivious to their celebration. Keeley, along with the other dwarves, decide to leave Lake Town and make their way back to the mountain to rejoin their company. 
As he departs, he pleads with Tauriel to come with him. However, Legolas intervenes, encouraging her to bid farewell to the dwarf. Before parting, Keeley presents Tauriel with the carved stone that he had shown her when they first met. Meanwhile, the surviving inhabitants of Lake Town salvage what they can from the ruins. Alfred tries to pilfer some supplies for himself, but Bard intervenes. Recognizing Bard as their savior for slaying Smaug, the townsfolk rejoice but quickly turn on Alfred, ready to punish him for his greed. Bard stops them once again, deciding instead to lead his people to the town of Dale, where they can seek refuge and rebuild. Upon arriving at the Lonely Mountain, the dwarves are reunited with Bilbo, who shares his concerns about Thorin. He explains that Thorin is slowly succumbing to the allure of the vast horde of gold within the mountain, losing his sanity in the process. Despite their concerns, they enter the mountain where Thorin, with a tinge of madness in his eyes, warmly welcomes them back to the kingdom of Erebor. Inside, they observe Thorin's growing obsession with the Arkenstone, which has consumed him day and night. Unbeknownst to Thorin, Bilbo has been in possession of the Arkenstone all along. However, he keeps this fact hidden, remembering Smaug's warning about how the stone could drive Thorin to madness. In Lake Town, Bard converses with Legolas, expressing his concerns about the impending danger to the Lonely Mountain. He predicts that the news of Smaug's demise will attract unwanted attention. His worries are confirmed as the scene shifts to reveal a massive horde of orcs, thousands of them led by their leader Azog, advancing towards Erebor. Bold arrives on the scene and informs Azog about the approaching elven army. Determined to face this challenge head-on, Azog orders Bold to travel to Gundabad, an orc stronghold, to amass an even larger orc army. He addresses his army, promising that the only thing awaiting the elves, dwarves, and humans at the mountain will be their graves. Back in Lake Town, Legolas and Tauriel receive this news about Bolg's movement towards Gundabad. Their discussions are interrupted by a messenger from Thrundwheel, delivering the news that Tauriel has been banished from the Elven Kingdom. In solidarity with Tauriel, Legolas also decides to leave, and together, they head towards Gundabad to investigate further. Gandalf, imprisoned in Dal Guldur, after discovering that the necromancer is indeed Sauron, is threatened by a large orc who tries to strip him of an elven ring. However, Gandalf's allies arrive just in time. Galadriel enters swiftly disposing of the orc. The Nazgul, nine ethereal figures who have succumbed to Sauron's power, arrive to confront them. Elrond and Saruman join Galadriel, holding off the Nazgul while she tends to Gandalf. Amidst the chaos, Radagast reappears in his rabbit-drawn sleigh to whisk Gandalf away to safety. Once the final Nazgul has been defeated, Sauron himself appears before Galadriel. He tempts her to join him, saying that it's too late to stop his plans, but she resists his allure and successfully banishes him from the fortress, although this powerful act leaves her weakened. Elrond suggests they should warn the others about Sauron's return, but Saruman tells him to focus on helping Galadriel and that he will take care of Sauron. Radagast, at his home, converses with Gandalf. Gandalf tells him of his plan to go to Erebor to warn his friends about the impending danger. Radagast, in a gesture of friendship and support, hands Gandalf his staff to aid him on his journey. In the depths of the Lonely Mountain, Bilbo hides the Arkenstone and approaches Balin to discuss it, careful not to reveal that he has the stone in his possession. Balin warns him that having the stone might further exacerbate Thorin's erratic behavior. Soon after, Bilbo and Thorin engage in a conversation, reflecting on their perilous journey and the trials they've faced to reach their current position. Their conversation is interrupted by news that the survivors of Lake Town have sought refuge in the nearby town of Dale. Back in Dale, Bard encourages his people to find rest for the night, promising them safety under his watchful eye. As night falls, it becomes clear that Thorin has no intention of sharing the vast wealth of the mountain with the survivors of Lake Town. Despite Keeley's protests that the people have nothing, Thorin insists that surviving Smaug's fire is reward enough for them, ordering the other dwarves to rebuild the entrance to the mountain. The very next day, King Thrundwheel makes a grand entrance into Dale, flanked by a vast army of elves. This formidable force stands guard as the survivors of Lake Town are provided with much-needed supplies of food and water, courtesy of his generosity. Thrundwheel speaks with Bard, proposing they form an alliance. His interest in the Lonely Mountain is a very specific treasure. White gems that were wrongfully denied to him by the dwarves in the past. Seeking diplomacy, Bard ventures alone to the main gate of the Lonely Mountain, hoping to convince Thorin to forge an alliance and avoid unnecessary conflict. Sheltered behind a hastily assembled barrier, Thorin dismisses Bard's appeals outright. His obsession with his hoard of treasure overpowers any sense of gratitude or responsibility he once felt towards the people of Lake Town. This stubborn refusal angers Bard, who departs the mountain in frustration. Inside the Lonely Mountain, the dwarves are preparing for the imminent conflict, donning their ancient armor. 
Thorin presents Bilbo with a shirt made of mithril, a precious metal that cannot be pierced by any blade. In Dale, Gandalf makes a dramatic entrance. He urgently confers with Bard and Thrundwheel, warning them of the approaching orc armies and the return of their dark enemy. His news confirms their worst fears and lends a newfound urgency to their preparations. In the meantime, Legolas and Tauriel are far to the north at Gundabad. There, they bear witness to a chilling sight. Thousands of orcs are gathering mobilizing for war. This vast and bloodthirsty horde is making its relentless way towards the lonely mountain, intent on claiming it for their own dark purposes. The shadow of war looms large over Erebor and its inhabitants. Late into the night, Bilbo musters the courage to sneak out of the mountain. He makes his way to a tent where Gandalf Bard and Thrundwheel are discussing their strategy. To their surprise, Bilbo hands them the Arkenstone, stating that he's claiming it as his share of the treasure. His intention is to allow them to use the stone to bargain with Thorin for peace. Despite the danger he's put himself in, Gandalf advises Bilbo to stay the night and then flee in the morning when Thorin discovers the theft, his wrath will be terrible. As morning dawns, the combined armies of Lake Town and the Elves stand resolute before the fortified entrance of Erebor. From the walls of the mountain, Thorin and his band of dwarves look out upon their assembled foes. Then Bard steps forward, revealing the Arkenstone to Thorin, and offers it in exchange for a portion of the treasure. At first, Thorin suspects a trick, but his suspicions are dispelled when Bilbo confesses to his actions. Thorin's fury is swift and fierce. He rages at Bilbo, denouncing the Hobbit for his perceived betrayal. Yet Bilbo, showing unexpected fortitude, confronts Thorin about his transformation, accusing him of becoming a shadow of the dwarf he once was. Thorin commands his dwarves to cast Bilbo over the side of the wall, they refuse, leading to Thorin attempting to do it himself. Gandalf intervenes, demanding that Bilbo be returned to him. Bilbo makes his escape, rejoining Gandalf. Bard poses a simple question to Thorin, peace or war? Thorin's response is a defiant growl, he chooses war. As the tension escalates, a new factor emerges the arrival of a dwarven army led by Dane Ironfoot, Thorin's cousin, there to lend their support to Thorin's cause. The standoff between the two armies comes to a stalemate, but when Dane, upon receiving no response to his call for surrender from the elves, orders his dwarven troops to charge, the battlefield becomes a sea of charging dwarves hurtling towards the stationary elven and human ranks. At Thrunwheel's command, the elves shoot a volley of arrows that rains death on the oncoming dwarves, but the dwarven ranks respond with a volley of their own unique arrows, which obliterate the elven arrows mid-air and strike the troops. The two armies collide in close combat, each side suffering heavy losses. In the midst of this ferocious clash, the ground shakes ominously, and gigantic earthworms emerge from the soil, stunning both armies into a momentary ceasefire. But this break is short-lived, as orc troops pour out from the holes created by the worms, charging toward the battle. The dwarven army rallies to form a defensive line, but just as the orcs are about to strike, the elves leap over the dwarves charging into the ranks. Azog sounds his warhorn, signaling the release of the war beasts, enormous orcs that cause chaos and destruction on the battlefield. As elves rain arrows on the beasts and dwarves utilize their war machines to counter them, the war beasts target and decimate several of these machines, dealing heavy casualties to the dwarves. Seizing this moment of chaos, Azog commands a second orc army to launch an attack on the city of Dale. Gandalf, realizing the imminent danger, rallies a group of men to prevent the orcs from breaching the city. But the orcs, equipped with makeshift catapults on their backs, hurl massive stones into the city, causing widespread destruction. Another massive orc charges headfirst into the city walls, breaching them and allowing the orcs to pour into the city. The orcs rampage through Dale, taking down the humans with terrifying ease. Bard joins the fray, bolstering his men as they make their stand against the marauding orcs. Gandalf and Bilbo too throw themselves into the fight. In the midst of the chaos, Bard spots his children at a distance, and his heart clenches in fear when a massive orc charges at them. He launches himself at the creature, managing to bring it down and save his children. On the battlefield, Thrundwheel and Dane Ironfoot lay waste to any orc daring to cross their path, Dane even seeming to revel in the carnage. In Dale, Bard orders the women and children to seek safety while the men continue their battle against the orcs. Bard once again dives into the thick of battle, taking down as many orcs as he can. Meanwhile, Thrundwheel demonstrates why he is truly the king of the elves. With an incredible display of power he takes out a score of orcs as he swings with lethal precision, cutting down any that dare challenge him. From his vantage point, Azog watches the battle unfold with a cruel smile, confident that the dwarves' numbers are dwindling rapidly. Dane Ironfoot, having dealt with his fair share of orcs, calls out to Thorin for help. Inside the mountain, Thorin's greed is getting the better of him. Dwalin attempts to bring him back from the brink, but his words only fuel Thorin's rage. Alone now, he finds himself in the Gallery of Kings, surrounded by a hardened gold floor. He hallucinates, imagining himself sinking into the cold, unyielding metal. This horrific vision serves as a wake-up call, helping Thorin break free from his obsession and regain his sanity. 
Meanwhile on the battlefield, the dwarves prepare to make their last stand against the encroaching orc forces. The Horn of Bomber reverberates through the air, a call to arms that rallies their spirits. Ingeniously repurposing a massive bell into a wrecking ball, the dwarves demolish the wall they'd constructed. As the dust settles, they march out to the battlefield, ready to join the fight in full force. Backed by his loyal comrades, Thorin leads an onslaught against the orc army, their spirits reignited with newfound hope. They eliminate every orc that stands in their path with a fury that echoes through the battlefield. Simultaneously in Dale, the humans, including women, counterattack in a renewed effort to defend their city. Ironfoot and Thorin find a moment amid the chaos to share a brief camaraderie, as they battle their enemies. With a determined resolve, Thorin decides to ascend Ravenhill, with the intent to slay Azog. He is joined by four brave dwarves on a battle contraption that carves its way through the orc army. Despite the relentless pursuit of a monstrous giant, they manage to evade its clutches when Bofur, controlling a giant of his own, intervenes and slays the pursuer. The war machine advances, crushing numerous beasts and foes in its path, bringing Thorin closer to his ultimate objective, Azog. From Dale, Bilbo and Gandalf watch the daring mission to behead the snake of the enemy forces. In the midst of this, Legolas and Tauriel return with troubling news of a second orc army advancing from the north. Thrundwheel encounters Tauriel as she prepares to aid the dwarves, warning him of Bolg's impending army. Thrundwheel, however, dismisses the dwarves' plight and doubts Tauriel's affection for Keeley. In response, she points her weapon at him. Unmoved, he belittles her threat, prompting Legolas to step in, defending Tauriel and aligning himself with her mission. Compelled to lend his help as well, Bilbo slips on the ring, becoming invisible, and traverses the battlefield to alert his comrades. Our valiant heroes brave their way up the mountain, eliminating any orc that dares to cross their path. Thorin assigns Philly and Keeley the task of scouting the towers and relaying their observations. Meanwhile, Thorin grapples with goblin mercenaries. Suddenly Bilbo materializes before Thorin, informing him of the approaching second orc army. But it's too late. Thorin turns around only to see a chilling sight. Azog holding Philly captive, and ominously declaring that Thorin is next. Philly meets a cruel end as Azog kills him and discards his lifeless body. Keeley, driven by fury, charges towards the tower, decimating every orc that stands in his way. Azog then engages Thorin in a lethal duel, exchanging powerful strikes that would be fatal to any average orc or dwarf. Just then, the battlefield intensifies as Bolg's army arrives, accompanied by giant nightmarish bats. These bat-like creatures wreak havoc on the dwarves, creating an uproar on the battlefield. In an ingenious move, Legolas commandeers one of these bats, using it as a steed to reach his enemies. Meanwhile, Thorin, initially dominating the duel, finds himself facing the arrival of the second army, which complicates matters for him and Bilbo. Tauriel leaps into the battle, swiftly eliminating around 10 orc minions. The focus then shifts back to Legolas, who executes a spectacular maneuver, killing nearly a hundred orcs in one move. Amid this chaos, Bolg enters the fray, knocking Bilbo unconscious. When Legolas finally lands on a tower, Thorin finds himself ambushed by orcs. From his vantage point atop the icy falls, Legolas spots and neutralizes the encroaching orcs. Bolg launches an attack on Tauriel, their skirmish intensifying with every blow, until Bolg manages to overpower her, hurling her against a wall. Coming to Tauriel's aid, Keeley valiantly faces off with Bolg, but he too is overpowered and suffers a fatal stab to the heart. A devastated Tauriel witnesses Keeley's demise, and in a burst of fury, grapples with Bolg, dragging him down the edge of a cliff face. From afar, Legolas observes the chaotic scene, his quiver now empty of arrows. Ingeniously, he manipulates a giant orc to ram a tower, causing it to collapse and form a makeshift bridge, enabling him to rush to Tauriel's side. As the tower crumbles beneath him, Legolas engages in a fierce combat with Bolg, skillfully navigating the cascades of falling debris. Just as an orc is about to strike a fatal blow on Thorin, Legolas hurls his sword, impaling the orc. He arms himself with his knives and plunges one into Bolg's skull. His lifeless body plummets through the decaying tower, hitting the ground and is crushed by falling debris. As the battle rages on, Radagast and Beorn arrive atop the Great Eagles swooping down to decimate the remaining orcs. Beorn, transforming into his formidable bear form, runs down and slices through the orc ranks with ease. Simultaneously, Thorin locks into a fierce duel with Azog on a frozen pool above the cascading icy falls. Azog, wielding a chained boulder, swings it towards Thorin, only to shatter the surrounding ice. Thorin seizes the moment, grabbing the boulder and flinging it towards Azog, causing him to sink into the icy depths. Thorin watches as he floats by underneath the ice, assuming him to be dead until the beast eyes snap open, catching him off guard. 
The orc, bursting through the ice, stabs Thorin in the foot and pins him down. Thorin holds him at bay, but sensing Azog's overpowering strength, he makes a daring decision and lets Azog stab him. In that vulnerable moment, Thorin seizes his opportunity to end the orc leader, thrusting his sword through the orc and into the ice below, leading to Azog's inevitable death. Wounded and fatigued, Thorin stumbles to a vantage point to survey the remainder of the battle. He collapses, and Bilbo rushes to his side. Apologizing for his past behavior and acknowledging the hardships he's put Bilbo through, Thorin finally accepts their friendship. As he breathes his last, Bilbo mourns his fallen friend. Tauriel also holds Keeley and cries over him. Legolas informs his father of his decision to leave their kingdom. Thrundwheel advises him to seek one of the Dune Dane, a man known by the name of Strider. Once Legolas departs, Thrundwheel finds Tauriel mourning over Keeley's body. As she questions why she has overwhelming pain, Thrundwheel gently responds, because it was real. Feeling the weight of their loss, the surviving dwarves gather and kneel next to their fallen leader, Thorin, in a solemn tribute. Together, the dwarves conduct a grand funeral, honoring their three fallen comrades who bravely reclaimed their mountain and sacrificed their lives for their kin. With their king gone, Ironfoot is named as the successor to the throne. Bilbo, feeling the pull of his homely hobbit hole, decides to leave the mountain. He asks Balin to bid farewell to the dwarves on his behalf. As he turns to leave, he is surprised to find them standing behind him. With heartfelt words Bilbo bids his friends a proper goodbye, extending an invitation to visit him at Bag End should their travels ever lead them there. Gandalf accompanies Bilbo back to the edges of the Shire. He tells him he was aware of the ring that Bilbo had possessed, however he claims he lost it along the way. Before their paths diverge, Gandalf offers him a word of caution, sensing the larger story that lies ahead. As Bilbo nears Bag End, he is taken aback to see his possessions being carried off by others. Presumed dead by his fellow hobbits, his belongings have been put up for auction. Asserting his very much alive status, he demands the return of his items. In his attempt to validate his identity, he produces the contract he once signed with Thorin's company. Back inside his beloved hobbit hole, Bilbo retrieves the hidden ring. The concluding scene shows the older Bilbo holding the ring in his hands. He moves to welcome his old friend Gandalf at the door, and the last sight for us is Thorin's map of Erebor, a symbol of their extraordinary adventure. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do and I'll see you on the next one.